be heard. Uh, but it's been a really great conference so far, I think. Um, last night, after all the conference proceedings were, were done, I went back to my room and I was reading a book called The Tipping Point, which is all about how um, individuals, such as ourselves, our networks, which I think we all are part of, and how social drivers, economic drivers, can bring about big changes in society and what are the, the, the ways that those um, happen. So it kind of occurred to me that I think with um, things like the school strikes, which have started here in Sweden, we have the Extinction Rebellion in, in the UK. Um, yesterday there was a letter published in Bioscience signed by 11,000 scientists who said, you know, we've reached a really critical point in terms of our efforts to decarbonize, uh, decarbonize society. So I think we're really at a tipping point in terms of addressing not just climate, but those other issues which people have raised about the United uh, Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and they've come up in a, a number of talks. Uh, and I think, you know, bioenergy has a, a really crucial role uh, to play in achieving lots of those goals. But the way that it's going to do that is by identifying the, the best routes through which we can go. And in order to understand that, it's important that we um, understand those environmental, those social impacts which might be associated with it in order to identify the desirable options um, which we uh, can then enact in policy through industry, etc. So I think it's going to be a really interesting and exciting um, session. And we're going to kick off, as we did with the other parallel sessions, with a view from uh, industry. I'd like to welcome uh, Patrick up to the uh, stage. He's going to give a talk on um, the role of European technology and innovation platform for bioenergy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, great to be here in Gothenburg. So it's very sustainable for me. I only had to travel from the north coast to here, so it was very sustainable. Normally I, I go by plane and it's not so good, but hopefully it saves some CO2 in the things I'm trying to do. So uh, today I'm, I'm representing ETIP Bioenergy, so it's the European Technology Innovation Platform for Bioenergy. Uh, my daytime job is with RISE, so Research Institute of Sweden. Uh, I'm a senior researcher in sustainable transport. So, um, and I think the, 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 let's say the headline of this conference is spot on, because this is what we're trying to do, to build a sustainable bioenergy industry. That is the purpose. So, uh, so this is my outline. Uh, I will try to make a movie of all of these slides, uh, but hopefully you will catch what I'm, I'm trying to uh, say. Uh, so describing just the platform, uh, we also have this strategic research and innovation agenda, which is a key output from such platform. Then discussing then the, the topic of this uh, session with the environmental impact from, from the industry and the ETP view. And then the red two, as we have spoken a lot about, the social aspects, and then also coming into the step plan. Uh, I'm also a member of this uh, step plan. There's the implementation working group working now to, to really make the step plan. So that's the strategic energy technology plan that the European Union has set up. And bioenergy is one area where Europe is supposed to be world leading. So I'm part of that work. And then some day to day. Okay. So uh, this platform is based on the energy union strategy. That, that's where it all comes from. So, um, and, and that is then our prime minister that has decided that we should have an energy union to have, a, um, yeah, and we should be leading in, in, in different areas. Uh, and this is uh, not really a new thing, it's the continuation of the European Biofuel Technology Platform that was established in 2006. And then also it's based on the European Industrial Bioenergy Initiative. So the ETIP as such was established in April 2016, and I have been the chairman since roughly two, uh, little less than two years. Okay, so this is the background. Uh, and the role is to bring the actors together um, 
as for example, we have in, in this conference, we have the academia, industry, civil society. So what we're trying to do is bring everyone together. Um, yeah. To that is, is engaged in this, and and also what we try to provide information that is unbiased and united, and also to bring a consolidated view. So when we meet uh, EU institutions and so on, we have a very clear. We try to raise the awareness level instead of just uh, you. It, it, it has been discussed in this conference, but for example, the acceptance of biomass. Uh, and th then we are also the main interlocutor towards the CD research and innovation. So, um, and also we, we work with this implementing this uh, strategic uh, plan. So this is our role that we have. And the stakeholders is basically through, throughout the, the value chain. So say it's, it's all of the starting from from the field over to the end use and also the, the universities and institutes and so on. So I think that's the key really to, to get everyone on board and for example also to get uh, truck manufacturers to talk to ship uh, manufacturers and so on. I think it's very important to, to, to have a lot of cross connections here. So we try to gather and, and it's a completely open platform. So, if you want to be active, anyone here wants to be active, it's free of charge and you can, you can join. We have also specific working groups on important topics. And sometimes it's quite a hectic discussion with the NGOs and uh, some other clash and so, so it's an interesting discussion. Um, okay. Uh, then this uh, strategic research and innovation agenda, this is really a key document. This can be downloaded uh, from the webpage of EP Bioenergy. Um, it was updated uh, last time in 2018. Uh, and also it, it gives a very good overview. It's, it's a document that you can read without falling asleep. So say it's, it's, it's not uh, 200 pages, it's more like 60 pages. I think it's quite, quite comprehensive. Uh, so you have the, the, the evolutions that have happened in the development of biofuels and bioenergy. Um, and also it, it highlights the need for research and development and demonstration. So the purpose is then to, to try to shape the future, let's say, research and like the Horizon Europe and so on. Um, and it also identifies the potential for biofuels and bioenergy uh, for transport. And, and it's a lot of knowledge that has been brought together through, through, through all of these stakeholders that you saw in the earlier slides. So that's, uh, if you want to learn more about what we're trying to do here, and also you can contribute if you feel that something is missing or, or just uh, you think deeper knowledge or something. Um, so, uh, yeah. And uh, uh, the recommendation is, uh, that we have the main recommendations that we have in this draft version is that that we need if, if we're going to build this industry we need the countries to, to implement for example the red 2 directive and also hopefully do it in a harmonized way throughout europe so that the countries talk to each other so we, that we don't have separate the same kind of ways of national implementation uh, and also to continue and work on relevant transport science-based data and tools for practical implementation of sustainable requirements in the legislation marketplace. Um, you have this delegated act, for example, the land use change and all of that. It needs to be practical. It shouldn't, it should support, it shouldn't, let's say, hinder development. Um, and also we, we need support to, to, to get efficient supply um, and following the system approach, and, um, and also we need to apply this key priority for commercial biofuels and technologies is to improve the environmental performance and economic uh, performance, and also work on this uh, integrated uh, bio bio refinery. Um, and also uh, we have talked uh, a lot about. Uh, different sectors that cannot have like electrification where it will grow slowly or, or really it's not suitable. So 
we need to give priority to, to technologies that target the heavy duty road, air, and marine transport. Because there is really a lack of um, low fossil carbon alternatives there. Um, and then also work to ensure this fair appreciation of CO2 emissions. So we need to have this well to wheel approach. For example, the heavy duty uh, regulation on CO2 is the tank to wheel approach, and biofuels is completely out of the picture in that uh, regulation, which creates a very uneven situation. Um, and then we, we need to execute the test plans. There's a lot of things that need to be done. Uh, and it is, uh, let's say, um, estimated that it's over 100 billion euros that needs to be put on the table jointly between uh, member states, EU, and also um, industry, and the largest part part is in the industry, in order to fulfill our uh, targets for 2030. Okay. The environmental impact of European biofuels deployment. Um, I guess overall we see that uh, there has been no significant reduction of energy consumption with greenhouse gas in the European transport sector. And there, there, if you heard about Sweden, it's about minus 20 percent, but overall it's not much happening. Um, and th this this market development is important. It's, it's in contrast also to this. That we actually have ambitious climate and energy targets on EU international level, so, so it's, it's a big mismatch. And also, biofuels is the only option, I would say, reducing greenhouse gas emissions immediately um, as uh, low blend and dropping can be used in the existing state. So, this is still basically the only, even though electric car sales are picking up, it's from a really low level. So today um, it's not uh, making a big difference um, and also uh, I think biofuels has been the forerunner of this uh, sustainability requirement so and I, I would see that it should also spread to other sectors that it's not just biofuels it needs to be sustainable but it's a whole range uh, and this is just an example for Germany. I guess Swedish figures are on the same. But for, if you calculate with the, the, the red directive uh, kind of principles, it's an 84% reduction on average in, in the German market. Again, it's the same in Sweden. Um, so, yeah, sustainability is there. But we, of course, we, we, we need to have the both perspectives. Uh, on the SDGs, of course. Um, and then uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the Red 2, um, we, we need a strong research and innovation strategy for advanced biofuels. And, and whether we like it or not, the internal combustion engine will be part of the, the energy transition. Um, and th therefore, we need sustainable biofuels. Um, and we can't only focus on e-mobility. We, as I said, we, we need to, to look at uh, those sectors where that will continue to rely on internal combustion engines. Um, and we need this uh, integrated approach. Policy needs to go hand in hand with technology development, research, and so on. So we need everything, and, and we we only have a short time frame. So so. It's, it's really an integrated approach. Um, and I would say, if you look at the targets of red food, that, that it's it's not very aggressive. So we we need a much higher ambition to reach the two degrees targets of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and I would say that red food is perhaps the the floor level or the bottom level, and then countries will move faster um, from their Paris uh, agreement to, let's say, a uh, roadmap for strategy. Um, and renewable fuels and biofuels is, of course, a key to, to uh, reduce there. Uh, the harmonized approach is really important. Um, 
robust sustainability framework. Um, and that is where it, a lot of development is also needed. How do you, for example, model the iLook concept? Because it's something that it's, it's, a, it's a concept that can't be modeled. <laughs> so, so it's a lot of work needed there to, to really get to grips with that. Um, and then we also have the, the sector coupling. We, we should have the well to wheel approach. Uh, as uh, some, I think it goes without saying, but as we have it now, right now, it, it's not a well to wheel approach. Um, social impact, it's been talked about, it is there available by mass, and, and I think as Tanya also showed in the early presentation this morning, uh, there's a lot of marginal and abandoned land. And that's a major issue. Uh, and um, it can be a win-win solution if you produce sustainable biomass on, on those um, with the job creation and so on. Um, and there's, there's a lot of options to, to increase this productivity without harming the food production and biodiversity, uh, in our view. Um, so yeah, I think. Yeah. Basically, there, there's this. We, we should. There's a lot of biomass that is really not questionable whether it's sustainable or not. So we we, we can work on that and then expand as we go further and, and increase the use of biomass. So um, and then uh, coming into the set plan, I think th this is uh, uh, there is no money in the set plan per se, but it, this is like an umbrella that's gathering all the activities that uh, are supposed to be going on to, to achieve the new target. Uh, and the objective is to accelerate decarbonization of the energy system and the transport by pushing these technologies. So there's a lot of scale up to, to make technologies more cost effective and also uh, just a simple scale up to get to the you can't skip the scaling up you, if you're going to do commercial activity. Uh, so it, it's a cooperation among EU countries, the companies, research institutions, such as RISE, I'm part of the core group of this. Um, and there is uh, 10 priority actions, and the action eight is the one that is relevant to, to us here, and that's renewable fuels and, and bioenergy. Uh, and this started this year in June, so it has kicked off. Uh, and uh, as such, uh, uh, EP Bioenergy has, uh, we, we have three people from, or we have not four people from, from the platform that is in this core team to, to drive this. Um, and it's, it's uh, managed by uh, the European Commission, the, the JRC, so it's a joint research center, but also the stakeholders for. For us, the European Commission that, is, that has the task to push this. Um, and uh, as I said, the total required investment to, to make it happen is to be exact 107 billion euros. So it's a lot of money. Um, there is uh, uh, different value chains. So you have the advanced liquid and gaseous fuels, the other renewable, uh, liquid and gaseous, renewable hydrogen and also combined heat and power and intermediate uh, bioenergy tanks. And there's a large chunk of this uh, 107 is to scaling up of advanced biofuels, uh, which is um, 70 billion euros. Um, and I, I would say I've, I've, I've heard Often, also yesterday and today, that um, for us it's been so negative and so on. And, and of course, everything is not uh, uh, shining and the sun is not shining every day. But I would say there is a lot of opportunities here. If, if also if we are active in Brussels and also active in research and innovation, then we will also have the possibility to have better policies. So we we should. We should be active, I think, and also take every chance to have to explain how, how you can do it in a sustainable way. But there is upcoming financing programs. We have the Innovation Fund, for example, 
of 10 million euros that will help to create the market. It's a continuation of near, near 300, but hopefully it will work. Um, one minute. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so uh, that's a very important tool. If you want to learn more about the innovation fund, I think it's uh, also a great opportunity for any industry player in the room here, because this, this tool could help you finance the investments in the production plant, and also it could give you 10 years of support, market support. So it could cover 60% of the extra cost that you would have in the market compared to your reference, for example, if you're producing a renewable diesel and then the cost of diesel is the reference. Um, and then you have the Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe. So there's a whole range of things here. And, and I, I think there is it's a sense of urgency. And, and I also feel that uh, biofuels is, is um, coming back a little. Uh, I think it's, people are starting to understand that you, you can't uh, rely on electrification for 100%. Um, yeah, and we are very active in, in in trying to influence all of these. Uh, we have had uh, in the preparation of innovation fund, we have had the uh, representative on some form, Swedish uh, fellow. So um, we're trying to do uh, to, to really show the potential role of the bio, biofuels in this. Um, so I'm coming to end. Uh, the deployment of biofuels is really critical for, for reaching the EU international climate and energy targets, that's for sure. Um, there's a mix, mismatch between the needs at the political framework to work and R&I activities. We need to do much more. Uh, key issues to optimize environmental impact and social benefits is to have a stable and supportive framework. Uh, broaden and mobilize the sustainable biomass resource. And we need this flexible and efficient convergence of some of the things. Um, and of course, we, we are ready to contribute. Um, I would just uh, like to, if, if you want to uh, go to Brussels in uh, the end of November, please come to our stakeholder plenary meeting. You will learn all about the, the, the new developments and also talk about uh, sustainability and so on. And uh, that's my final slide. So this is the supporting team, the project partners and uh, in the secretariat for the ECS Bio meeting. And so you have a webpage. Thanks a lot. I didn't want to rush you through to find out secret there. I thought I'd be the right. least popular person in the uh, conference if I did that. Um, so, time for a bit short for time, then we'll go straight to questions from the audience. I saw lots, so I'm very keen um, over there. Might as well maybe rush forward here. My name is Sergio Rafael from BTP BDO. Um, I think all the people here in Bloom agree with what you say. Um, what I'm worried about is the fact that the NGOs are very effective in influencing the politicians in Brussels. So I'm afraid that if you give the same presentation to NGOs, that they will say no to anything. So I'm very worried about you always concentrate that industry on the content, but the content will absolutely not save us. I see you doing a good job. I also be there on the 20th of November in Brussels. I would be also like to contribute, but I feel that we need more passion because as we heard, heard, heard it also yesterday, people do not trust us. So throwing more content on them will not change this. So I hope that you can just comment on this. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And, and, and they don't want to be confused by facts, you know. So, so um, and, and that, that's. And it's something that we have spoken a lot about. How, how do we, how do we influence these influencers? Because they, they are creating a mess for us, and, 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 and they also claim that they 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 have the opinion of the public, which has been the direct, let's say, discussions in, in our meetings. That the NGO claim are we are representing the public, and they're saying biofuels is bad, and and then it's just. It starts. So, so, but, but it's it's something that we we need to do. We we need to speak in wider wider circles, not just 
biofuel brands uh, among friends. <laughs> we need to go wider, and but we have a strategy for that. But I, I'm, I'm, I think we need to do a lot more. We have a big co press conference on the 21st in Brussels at the press club, so we'll, where we will try to spread the message that this is really key and we can do it sustainably. Uh, but uh, as you said, those facts uh, will not uh, change. Uh, I had a, a battle with one NGO one time, and and, uh, and he he said, I said, yeah, but trucks running on biofuels they can be really sustainable. And then he said, yeah, but I don't like trucks. You should have a cargo bike. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Uh, but and that was from one of the major NGOs in Brussels. So, so and this is uh, it's a constant issue. So and we yeah, we're working on it. In the right way. <laughs> okay, we have one more question. Please. Um, my name is uh, Helena Hofer, I'm from Exelon. We are a big producer, hopefully more biofuels in the future. Uh, and I absolutely share your view on biofuels being part of the solution. And well, to read, as you mentioned, the uh, important criteria to choose, and also that we understand them. The, the base of or, or the use of biomasses, and that's that's one of the problems that the uh, the Red Two Directive has a long list of biofuels, but uh, bio feedstock, I mean, but they it's not technology agnostic. Uh, so uh, my question is, do you work in the ecosystem platform to try to well <laughs> influence on 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 the uptake of Red Two Directive? Because I, I think there are systems out there that should uh, have um, to proved to be very good uh, greenhouse gas achievement and so on for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I sometimes find it puzzling to, to, to how did we end up where we are today? Because like even 20 years ago, we had a quite clear view that we need, we need biofuels and now we end up with this kind of directives and it's multiple directives that trying to regulate the same thing and it's not really efficient and we have these lists and blah 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 all of that and and that I think is a it's a great mess and it's uh, also constant update so it's uncertain if we but uh so but we have what we have and I think red two is, is somewhat more, more more somewhat more positive um but and and we we have during that process of Red 2, we, we have made a lot of, when there has been consultations and so on, but we've also made, uh, let's say, our position papers and trying to influence all the time that this is this. So we, we put a lot of work in, into trying to, to influence that. Uh, but um, uh, I think we, we still have uh, improvements to be made to, to take away this market uncertainty, uh, because that, that has been a showstopper before now, now the discussion is more positive because and we know we also see investments happening like for CCD uh, and others so I think it's more positive now but it, it, it's uh, it has been a lot of work and it will be I think in the future as well trying to try to influence together so, this is meaningful okay. way okay thank you I think we'll have to work on questions from Sweden thank you <laughs> thank you Rob. She's a senior scientist in the Swedish Environmental Research Institute, and she's going to speak about uh, biogas development, public procurement networks, and policy constraints. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to be one of the speakers at this conference. It has had a very high level of expectation, I think. Uh, but um, I'm presenting on behalf of the project leader, this project leader, Thomas Lundqvist, who is a big colleague of mine, also working at IBL. Uh, and the project is a joint project between IBL and uh, the only assistant of the Ministry of Transport and Other Parts here, the two main research partners. Uh, well, some background, uh, because now we're moving into specifically biomass. And in Sweden, the use of what we call vehicle gas, which is a um, mixture of natural gas and biogas. Uh, has the practice since 2008 until 2017. Uh, and as you can see, the uh, the total amounts have kind of been stagnated at the same level, but uh, the share of biogas has increased. Uh, but what should be said, 
the that is that the use has increased of our gas, but the Swedish production has not increased using stable for the velocity. Uh, and the reason for that, or the explanation, is that we have started importing more biogas from Denmark. And uh, this import is uh, due to double subsidy. Uh, one subsidy in Denmark, one subsidy in Sweden, making it more uh, uh, competitive to, to, sell, to sell this biogas and use it in Sweden. Uh, but also, when you look into look at, look into biogas from a European perspective, uh, Sweden is a major user of biogas for our transport in the EU, representing about 74 percent. I think it was in 2015 that number. But it's of course also it's also started to be used or has been used uh, in several years in other countries. Uh, I listed some of them here: Germany and the Netherlands and UK. I think they uh, the main uses for just for transport. But of course, biogas is of course producing it for other purposes as well. So this is from the sort of transport side. Uh, but also, since there were a lot of presentations yesterday, where it is a lot talked about liquefied biogas, uh, I also thought I could mention something about that here. Uh, well, in Sweden, there is a very, very limited or marginal uh, use of this uh, for production and use of this kind of thing uh, in relation to the total biogas production. And also, I thought I should take the opportunity to talk about another study that we've been performing that has been focusing on liquefied biogas, and where we have made scenarios for production and demand of liquefied biogas in Sweden. Um, so we've made some scenarios based on production, the current production, and then also based on plans, and also making an increase of the country then based on what we can use, which is the green, uh, green line here. And then we made some scenarios also for the potential demand. Also starting from the current demand, you can see uh, very low, but then there has been also a lot of uh, policy support uh, going into LPG because we have had possibility to apply some money to, to uh, make some extra funding or some policy for buying tech, for example, uh, uh, trucks that can be run on LPG. So there are, uh, have been approved, I think, up to like around 560 to 600 trucks that run on LED that then will be bought in the coming years if uh, the, the amount of profit money will do that. Um, so then we added that and also there is plan for, well there has been an investigation of a uh, policy for LED, or not for LED, but for trucks, sort of pushing environmental trucks. So then we made some assumption that like if that policy is implemented, what would that be in terms of demand? And then we also made uh, some assumption related to shipping in Sweden. Yesterday we heard about Norway and that Sweden is starting to run on LPG. And we made some assumptions on, okay, what, what ferries around Sweden so that Norway could be interested in using LPG or is talking about using LPG. Uh, and then we ended up with a few scenarios kind of uh, looking at the demand. And then what we kind of what is our main conclusion is that, of course, as you can see here, then the blue lines representing the demand, they seem to be much higher than the domestic production capacity. And of course, I mean, in reality, uh, you would assume that they would be more uh, linked together. But uh, this is then a consequence of the, the current like, policies and current plans. So I think it's a good uh, indication for policymakers. But uh, that was sort of enough about the focus on LPG, and we go back to the more general uh, discussion on biogas, and also then the, the local focus that we have in the other study. And the aim of that study is to kind of try to provide some support and recommendations for the support of local biogas development for the transport sector. And then we, this project is then the outcome is aimed for local policymakers in this area. And how have, what have we done in this project? Well, we have done a lot of interviews with different policymakers, and we also uh, look into literature, of course. And we have focused on three tools for biogas development. It's public procurement, action networks, and policy instruments. And we have had three specific Swedish case studies, Gastenberg, and we did around here, which is for Vesterhjelsenland, and Luleå, which is then more of the northern, the northern part of Sweden, and Gotland, which is one of the islands outside of Sweden. That belong to Sweden, uh, of course. But uh, so, and they were selected because they also represent uh, some regions or that has been pushing uh, renewable fuels for quite some time. 
oil adlers have been have a less less focus on that. So they were supposed to kind of uh, give a broad picture of what is happening in the different regions in Sweden. But also in Sweden, we have the uh, region in Skåne, which has been very uh, even more oppressed, of course, in all some area. Uh, but that has been more researched uh, earlier on than the focus on. Uh, and this I'm not to include that in this particular study. So, uh, sort of one of the aims to, to provide for the local policymakers was to kind of come up with some uh, and describe some uh, success factors uh, and try to explain them, but also then try to highlight them for and to be used then by other policymakers and other, um, other local policymakers. And the success factors that we have identified as uh, the main or most important ones, uh, not listed in a specific order here, but it's a clear political ambition and appropriate decision making basis. And I, I would assume that most of you have heard that by my hundred or a thousand times already now. But here we mean that that's also important on the local level, not only on the national level, it's also important on the local level to have this clear political ambition and uh, uh, have good decision making material. Uh, and also, we found it very important uh, with the environmental friendly partners in Sweden in order then to support uh, renewable fuels in general, but specifically also biogas. And also, linked to public procurement, it's very important also to have follow up of this or follow up this public procurement. It's not only that you can implement it and I think that it will solve the issue, I will come back to some examples of that. And also it's very important to understand that you need to deal with an uneven system growth because of course different parts of the biogas system or renewable fuel system can develop uh, different in different ways and uh, not as rapid in some areas as in others. And finally, also, it's important with collaboration and diffusion of information and, of course, knowledge sharing. And they are this issue also we're talking about a lot. But now I will give some examples from the regions for these success factors in order to understand what we are kind of doing in more, more into, in detail. Well, it, related then to this, uh, uh, that is, there is a need for clear political ambition. Uh, well, uh, of course, you have to have uh, some kind of strategies for targets in your uh, municipalities is very good, of course, for promoting this. And it's also important not only to have the targets or visions or strategies, but you also need to implement them. And it's also very important for municipalities or the regions to, to, um, to take the lead and show that you can use these vehicles. For example, in uh, waste collection for the trucks, do waste collection and the buses or uh, also the municipality car own cars, for example. And that we've also, I mean, that's the same case also for electric vehicles, which we're studying in another project. That is, we also can see that that is very, uh, very important for what happens in the municipality and what uh, private persons do. Uh, they kind of look more, uh, if they see the cars running around in the street, then they get more um, secure about showing them themselves. So that's not specifically only for biogas, but also for other types of car segments or new car segments. Uh, and as an example here, we noted that Gotland has very strongly reported out biogas as the primary transportation, transportation fuel uh, from a regional perspective of the municipality, and given its priority then in the public procurement process, which of course has an impact on this. And related to environmental friendly public procurement, uh, there is of course, uh, you need to learn how to use it and how to, uh, to, um, to get the highest impact of it. Uh, and for example, we have noted that you can use some specific contractual conditions, uh, for example, allowance for supplies to adjust gradually to meet the demand. Uh, for example, you can gradually increase uh, the, the number of gas, gas vehicles if you, have, if you are in the public transport area uh, and purchase them or if that's what you purchase. So, and then the result of that would be that more supplies uh, of biogas, but also of other new fuels then can participate in the procurement. Uh, and the uh, example I mean, all of the regions that we looked into, of course, uh, looked into this or used public procurement. But of course, in different extents, uh, so for Vestra Götaland, for example, they have prioritized gas and electric vehicles for transport persons within the region. And Gotland has then uh, specifically had a demand for biogas vehicles, while Luleå has a more general uh, demand of renewable fuels, not specifically pointing out the specific ones, which of course, has led to different developments in these areas. And what I said about this follow-up for public procurement, uh, it's also that you should be have follow-up on all of the stages, which is in the public procurement uh, 
uh, uh, possible the decisions when you're trying to decide in the beginning. You need to follow up and perhaps not need to update that. I mean, the current government can do uh, something easy or have a new, new policy government coming up, and then you need to also revise your decisions, of course. If they need to be revised, we see what happens uh, on the national level, for example. And also do electoral procurement and all sorts of different sub ordering changes. Uh, and that's uh, the most important reason for having this follow up is to ensure the compliance or to ensure that you get what you actually want to. Uh, and as a um, like success story, an example, a good example of this, that the Yasan and they, as I said, they had that demand for electric vehicles or gas vehicles. But also, I mean, you had the possibility of choosing another car. Uh, as there are more lot options. But then they demand a vehicle exemption when you can suborder this, uh, uh, for example, diesel vehicle, uh, which then is one way of actually showing that we are very keen on that we choose the first options that we have uh, put on our list. And then also, I think the ones that are like doing the purchase of the specific car then need to actually think one more time okay, do I really need to? make this so do i have a good argument for uh, being and then among the process about dealing with an unmeaning system growth well biogas is of course sort of in an initial stage still and it's a large technical system that develops uh, in different or unevenly as i said maybe it's, it's uh, yeah, developed in different areas uh, for example i mean you have the production and you have use but you also have infrastructure parts and also running uh, different regional system of it uh, and then it's important, of course, to, to address which parts of the system that are lagging behind. Because if you put all your uh, effort into try, trying to increase the use, and if you don't have any uh, pump stations or fuel stations for that in the region, then that, of course, people are not very interested in buying uh, biogas or batteries or any kind of fuel mix, of course. Uh, and it's easy to, I mean, you think that, well, that's obvious, but it's not really the case in all the, the regions that we have this. Finger, so yeah, there's been a support in one of the specific areas. Uh, and as an example, in Lulu, for example, there have been um, there's a need for investment in infrastructure uh, to allow biogas demand to grow. They have uh, a fuel station for for the uh, regional or the uh, municipal uh, use of biogas, but there is not a private or the fuel station for guys, the private uh, person, for example. But in other parts of Sweden, it does not have to be. It doesn't have to be the investment in the infrastructure that's lacking in the other uh, part. And in many times, it's a only demand problem. And of course, this goes on with um, for the gas base, but also liquefied by gas, which also is also one of the issues. And finally, but not uh, the least important, is of course is about actor and actor network and collaboration. Uh, and actor network uh, is referred to as like collaborative management structures for public private partnerships and super grids. Meaning that you should uh, uh, be aware that you need to collaborate because there are so many parts of this chain that need to, to work together or come hand in hand or something some. And uh, this actor network uh, that we talk about it can of course help to account for like things that are uh, uh, crucial for the system. And also trying to find a more dynamic development of biogas and not running into problems with that there is not then, even though you have a fuel station, there might, might not be enough gas there, for example. Uh, and also, I mean, important for this actor network, I mean, is actor diversity, that you have to have actors from all different areas within the chain, and that you need to make sure that they are integrated and that this is stable network, but they have also have opportunity and resources for collaborating. And then the, the region or the municipalities have a very important role in kind of trying to engage in this and making sure that these actor networks can work in the region, even though it's not, uh, so they are one part of it, but they also have a specific role that's trying to initiate and make sure that it can work. So, and an example of that, I mean, of course, actor networks have been very crucial in all regions for biogas development. So there are different strengths and weaknesses, of course, of actor networks in the different these regions. So the research team, uh, as I said, I'm Yale and the Luleå Technical University, and we have a uh, big reference group of people who've been involved and giving comments and providing input to this policy from the different regions, of course, that are involved. And this is a project that's been part of the uh, of the um, 
research program renewable transportation fuels and system and funding from the Swedish Energy Agency and the Swedish Nordic Fund for Renewable Transportation. And just shortly about outcomes, well, our report will finalize this auction, so you will be uh, very happy if you're interested in it. And we will also uh, continue writing an article. And that was all. Thank you. So um, I will go straight to the audience for a question if anyone's got one. I had a question on, on methane. I have a hard time telling the difference between biomethane and regular methane. Uh, and wouldn't it be more efficient at least if you injected the biomethane in the normal grid and then you just counted the number of methane you import from the grid uh, rather than make specialized compensation for, for biomass? Uh, yeah, the, uh, that would be a good idea, but it's really we only have a very limited amount of this system for compensation. So, we like, for example, for it's only here the West Coast, which doesn't have any system, and the rest of the city we don't have a good system for wood. So, and the production of biogas is also made locally, for example, in another part. And other parts of Sweden, we have uh, a larger system, and then we don't have this limited system to the uh, uh, But we do have lunch after uh, at 12 30, so any further questions can yeah. be asked then. Thank you. Have a nice one. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's a joy. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Sam Cooper from the University of Banff, and he's going to be talking about forecasting um, impact, a case study um, for of bioenergy. Uh, yeah. uh, oh. Hopefully. Oh. Hi, I'm Sam. Uh, so, how oh, yeah, you looks good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so this talk, I uh, just wanted to talk a bit about uh, how global warming impacts vary with time. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, this is a sort of bioenergy conference, so we're probably at least uh, to some extent aware that um, emissions, uh, so carbon dioxide emissions and carbon dioxide absorption can happen at different times and you might have like a net zero sort of effect, but there's some temporal stuff and some, some complications there. Uh, but uh, what we wanted to do here is just explore that a little bit more, explore uh, both the effect of those different timings, but also look at how different gases uh, might, might affect those results. So uh, just to quickly say, the, uh, the work is part of the SuperGen project. Marcel is the uh, sort of instigator of this, this sort of idea. Uh, Rowan, uh, she's just uh, one of our recent master's students, uh, has sort of provided the case study for this. And Laura uh, is, a, is a, a maths associate. Um, she did all the sort of development of this. So, like I say, um, so we're looking at the fact that you have uh, an emission at a certain time, but the impact of that emission, uh, and here we're thinking about the global warming really, uh, that occurs after the emission. So I thought we'd just have a quick refresher as to what that really looks like and, and what's going on there. So, <clears throat> so if we look up, so top, top left corner, uh, so we have say three gases, things of iron, so a kilo of CO2, that's the black one, or methane, that's the green line, or say nitrous, uh, oxide, that's the sort of the bottom uh, grey line. Um, over time, the concentration of those, of that kilo, that initial kilo, is going to decrease. And this isn't to do with, uh, so just to be clear, this isn't like a bio uh, absorption thing, well, not primarily anyway. Um, this is just naturally what's going to happen. Uh, so you can see methane disappears pretty quickly, uh, nitrous oxide decays after quite a while, carbon dioxide decays quickly to begin with, and then it kind of levels out. So <clears throat> the next thing of interest is we look to the top right. Uh, so this is kind of how much, uh, how much it's warming the atmosphere at a given point in time. So the kind of the rate of warming, the power of them. So this, this is kind of determined by the concentration of the gases. So these, these lines basically follow the same shape as the ones on the left, but also the potency of each of those gases. So you can see nitrous oxide well up the top, uh, and then methane, and then carbon dioxide right down at the bottom there. 
So that's how much it's warming the atmosphere at a given point in time at the, the, the rate of warming. So what we might then be interested in is maybe, uh, well, how much is it warming the atmosphere in total up to that point in time? So this is where we go to the bottom left. This is the absolute global warming potential. So here it's just going to be basically cumulative. So it's the it's the area under those those top uh, top right kind of curves. Uh, and so you can see uh, carbon dioxide, the black one again. It, it's actually apart from a bit of the beginning, uh, the early years, it's actually pretty linear uh, because the concentration doesn't change a whole lot after the first few years. Uh, the nitrous one is slowly kind of curving around. The, the methane is a bit of warming to begin with, but then it's pretty much flat because there's no methane left to give any additional warming. That's absolute global warming potential. And then to make it into sort of numbers which are more useful, we typically uh, we normalize it against um, CO2 effect. So that's where you get your global warming potential. Um, and this is the ratio basically between those, those different lines. Uh, you can see that varies as you go along. Uh, so a global warming potential will actually have to be defined relative to a certain time horizon. So typically 100 years, but it could be 20, 50, 500 often. And you can see that that would vary depending on your choice of time horizon. And then the last metric, uh, which is kind of worth just mentioning, is um, your absolute global temperature potential. So this is trying to translate it using a sort of idealized, uh, really simplified global sort of temperature model into what is the effect on temperature that that initial kilogram of, um, of emissions has. So here we can see uh, CO2, it has an initial sort of like bump, but basically it levels off fairly quickly at a, at a particular rate. Methane, uh, after about 50 years, if, I, if we emit a kilo of methane now, 50 years the temperature effect um, will be pretty minimal. Uh, and then nitrous, you can see it sort of it curls off a bit as well. So, so the first example, again, this is really some, sort of a, a, an idealized case. It's just thinking, well, what does this mean if we, uh, we have a situation where we have an initial pulse impulse um, emission of CO2? So not, not worrying about those other gases just for a moment. Um, and then over the course of the next 50 years, we reabsorb that. So uh, arguably this isn't representative of a forest, but maybe it is. It, but it's that kind of what, 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 is, what would happen. Uh, kind of case. So you can see the, um, the CO2 concentration is, is you drop down, it's actually going to go negative, and then it's going to sort of re sort of start to get back to its equilibrium point. The um, global warming potential is going to go up, it's going to start to decrease, but actually by the time even, even though we've got to um, basically sort of net zero emissions by year 50, uh, by the time you even get to 100 years, the global warming potential is still quite significant. Okay, then but then actually, oddly, when we look at the potential for um, the temperature change, uh, it peaks sort of around about 20 years after that initial emission. Then 50 years in, um, the effect is pretty, uh, pretty minimal. And potentially, I mean, this is a very simplified model, but it potentially goes negative uh, by the time we get to 100 years. So uh, that's, I think, interesting. I, I think a big caveat, and I think that's which is worth mentioning here, is uh, it's tempting to kind of look at the temperature potential because temperature is something which we can kind of relate to, and I think that's, that's the metric to go for. Um, actually, the damage mechanisms for global warming are quite varied. Uh, they're quite, they're very complicated. Um, some, some effects like heat waves, probably temperature is the thing you'd be most likely to translate to that. Some things like, say, uh, ice caps melting, uh, maybe the warming is actually more of a relevant metric. Um, extreme weather events, possibly kind of mixed with the two. Some things like adaptation, uh, probably actually the rate of change, which is more relevant. So my point is, don't. It, uh, this is just to sort of give an example. Um, it's not to say that this being negative, um, which is like you know a good thing, means that 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 situation is overall good. It's it's a little bit more uh, nuanced than that. Okay, so that's the situation. If we've kind of got some temporal uh, changes in when the emission or the absorption is happening. Um, I guess here what we want to think is, well, what if everything happened in year one, uh, but we've got a few different gases involved? So, uh, so this is based on some of the stuff which Rowan did. So uh, looking at, uh, it's around about 300 different case studies uh, that she was taking on how you describe district heat networks uh, using different bioenergy options. And there's a range of different results, uh, and it's quite, it was a good study actually. Uh, some of them, very high uh, emissions, uh, overall, measured by your global warming 100 potential kind of metric. Uh, some of them actually 
uh, really uh, negative emissions. So, and, and also part of this is that there's a range of different uh, feedstocks and routes involved. So what we thought we'd do is we just take four uh, options, which are the sort of the ones just highlighted in green there, and see, uh, because, because they, they're slightly different kind of routes and stuff. Well, what happens then if we look at the effect over time? <clears throat> Uh, also, I should just say this is uh, this data is taken from like Biograde Two, so it's, it's just, uh, so it, we're not trying to pull it apart. This is it was actually very much uh, a standardised uh, way of looking at it. So this is taken the first two examples, which are forest residue pellets and wood chips, uh, which are basically it's primarily a CO two um, emission. And again, we're just thinking about things happening in year one. They're not trying to play with emissions varying over time. Um, and the actual global warming potential over the 100 year um, time horizon is, uh, that's actually quite a decent result, I think, for supply and heating. Um, and you can see that the global warming potential increases with time, but it's fairly linear, so I think we're quite happy with that. Um, and again, temperature potential is fairly straightforward, so not think too much to worry about here, I would say. When we look at the uh, AD options with methane, it's a little bit um, more interesting. Uh, this wasn't really the um, result we were expecting, and I think that's why it's kind of a bit interesting. Um, yes, so just to be clear of this, what, what, what we're saying here, so for these uh, AD options where the complication is that there's methane being um, effectively displaced at the start, and then also a CO2 emission. Uh, so that's where the, the, the weirdness is coming from. But essentially, we could look at the final results. Uh, so those global warming 100 things, which are basically the points uh, normalized uh, at the, that, that very end 100 year time horizon. And they, look, they all look fairly similar. I mean, one is a bit negative. The others, uh, they vary a bit, but they're all kind of quite reasonable. But you would never know from that that if you go back only 15 years, really it's changed quite a lot, and their relative merits uh, in terms of global warming have changed quite a lot. If you go back uh, to say just the 40, the 15, 40 year, year horizon, it's a completely different story, and there's no way of knowing that from those um, final figures, the, the, the headline ones that you get out of um, uh, whatever, whatever basically the approach you're taking. And then, I mean, if we look at global uh, temperature potential, actually it gets even stranger. I mean, here we've got a situation where 40 years after the emission, we've got a net um, cooling effect from the two scenarios, but also um, a temperature increase from them. So it's, it's, it just, it, I guess the point is, it's, it's quite a complicated situation, um, and certainly not something which uh, intuitively I think we'd expect. Um, and um, nothing which we would really be able to tell from the final results that we're looking at. <clears throat> so that's all well and good. Um, the, I mean, a lot of those effects in terms of variations in publication and so on, they're things which I think uh, the uh, sort of climate scientists and stuff, they're well-known effects. So there's nothing new in that. I think our concern is that uh, from an LCA or a, a sort of a climate accounting point of view, um, they're perhaps uh, less recognized. And those are probably the emissions and those are the figures and metrics which are most likely to be um, used for decision making. Um, and in some cases that's appropriate, in other cases it might well not be. Okay. So our first recommendation is that if uh, if we're looking at a situation a system where there are different gases involved, especially short-term uh, climate forces and, and longer-term ones, then uh, that's recognised ideally with some sort of time uh, representation, as we've done there. Um, and I think one of the barriers to that is that it, it just feels a bit complicated. It's one extra step when we've already got enough things to think about. So one of the things which is what uh, Laura was doing is we produced a very simple spreadsheet um, just so you can plug in the numbers and then see whether it is a relevant effect that makes a difference or whether it doesn't. Um, and failing that, just to at least recognize in any studies if there is, um, if the global warming potential that's being uh, reported actually depends upon just CO2 or whether there are uh, temporal effects with emissions or different gases involved. <clears throat> and then just briefly a couple of broader conclusions. 
the first one is that we would like to look at other um, impacts, uh, not just for the woman. We think there might well be, there'll be different mechanisms, but possibly some real effects with those. Um, more generally, um, I think once you start to look at that, that temporal aspect a bit more, it really supports the idea uh, that I think Patricia was mentioning yesterday actually. But even if the options we're looking at are maybe not optimized for the long term, um, effects now in terms of reducing carbon dioxide are really quite quite valuable. And the, the kind of discount, I don't mean discounting in a financial sense, but the, um, the way in which we treat them um, can be legitimately different. And then finally, um, perhaps more speculatively, uh, there might be a case for, for splitting policy. So we're encouraging the activities that actually absorb the carbon dioxide earlier. Um, again, whether or not we've entirely optimized that priority. Cool, thank you. So uh, that's a link to the spreadsheet. If you wanted to have a, a play with it, I'd really welcome any feedback if you're making that user friendly, if that's kind of your, your thing. Um, there we go. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, time for one uh, quick question. Who wants to go? Uh, there we go. Okay. Hello, Simon here from Research Institute of Sweden. I was wondering, in the project where I have participated, when we look at forest residues, we always calculate the difference between leaving the forest residues in the forest, where they decay and give yield to CO2 emission, versus burning them and getting a, a quick pulse of CO2. Is that also how you handle it? It doesn't really care. Uh, no, so there's, there's, there are also legitimate questions about how you do that, and I totally agree. Um, here, I think, um, and of course, as you point out, depending on how you do that, that will affect the result. Um, here we, so the initial, so those case studies were just um, just trying to be as straightforward as possible using the biograce output. So it doesn't really, um, it just follows the, the follows there, which isn't, isn't necessarily appropriate. Uh, I think the point was just that the, the output you get doesn't really represent what's happening earlier in time. Um, yeah, I mean, your actual treatment, it depends on the patient, and I think that's a broader, broader discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you. Awesome. Enjoy. Oh. <laughs> so, as part of my, my sort of chair's notes, I'm supposed to provide a, a, a pithy conclusion at the end, but I don't think I'm going to have to because our final talk has an excellent title that sounds like it's going to include the whole assembly. Can the Nordics become CO2 negative by 2040? And uh, to speak to that is Kenneth uh, Carlson. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a, yeah, a study uh, based on uh, some Nordic projects. I think that's going back. Yeah, the Nordic Energy Research have some flagship projects and they're ending actually this month. Uh, so, Can we just move it there? Oh, yeah. I don't share the book. So now we're ready. Yeah, so yeah, can the Nordic countries live up to the Paris Agreement or become CO2 neutral by 2040 or something? It's uh, in, in the same track. So uh, this uh, study uh, we did a year ago and we are about to update it, uh, and, but it's a rep uh, it was a study, a common study by these three projects. One project focusing on how to uh, create a, a technology that can. Uh, uh, the capture CO2, uh, that's the negative CO2, of course. Uh, project shift, where I have been most involved, uh, is about uh, sustainable transport in the Nordic uh, countries. And then there's uh, the flag for rest, which is looking at the power system, how to make that flexible. And here we have combined that in the flex for rest. There's a power system model covering uh, Northern Europe. Uh, so we keep uh, an eye on the 
trade and deliver uh, capacity in different countries. In the project ship, we have made a, a detailed model for all sectors in three countries, uh, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. So the things I represent you is only from Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Uh, we haven't included Finland in the model yet, but that will hopefully come. So just to remind you about the problem, well, you know that it's a budget problem we have, the atmosphere we are filling up with uh, greenhouse gases, but it's, it's not that simple you just heard, but uh, let's keep it uh, simple for now. Uh, so, and we have some limits where we say, okay, this is uh, not good to pass. If we try, try to stay below 1.5 degrees, we are really close to that concentration level. So what we can do is stop the task drilling more CO2 into the atmosphere. And we can also try to take some CO2 out of the atmosphere either in uh, planting more forests or doing carbon capture and storage. Uh, so I'm just going through when we're talking about getting the Nordic countries net negative by 240, we need all the solutions, including the carbon capture and storage. So this is another way of reminding you that we are in deep trouble. If you look at the budget we have in these three countries, uh, you can divide them in different ways in countries, but this is redundant in one way here. And then you can see if we want to stay below two degrees, it's the blue area, and we want to stay below 1.5 degrees. It is either <laughs> one of the red areas. Actually, the recent report from IPCC gave us a little more space for the 1.5 degrees, but still. The gray is the yearly emission from these three countries, so you can just see how many times you can have the gray block in the red block before we need to pass our budget. So we need to, so we have spent a few to 10 years actually to to, to make this uh, net emissions stop. So, so why do we need negative CO2 emissions? Um, and that is, you can say, to buy time, uh, because if we are going to stick with the 1.5, we need to follow a path maybe looking like the blue line here. Uh, and that could be hard in some sectors. So alternatively, we can find a little milder path and then go negative in the future to like to pay back our debt to the atmosphere, you can say. And it could look like this. Uh, now it's not how we suggest in Norway to do it, but it's just an example where we have a, also a spreadsheet where you can play around with all the countries in the world and you can see, okay, if, if they should uh, stay below a certain level, how could they, that be done? So you can see here that uh, when you come to the purple line, then Norway has spent their budget, so that's pretty far. So if, if we're not going negative, they should drop to zero before that line. Then they are quite busy. What you could do is continue a bit and then start going negative. And of course, depending on if you're going to zero or staying above zero, then you have to go more or less negative to, to catch up with this. And we can look at Sweden and Denmark, the same story. And then you heard a lot about the biofuels, of course, in this uh, uh, conference and how much is uh, needed and so on. And just uh, in our studies, we include the country's share of international aviation and shipping. And I think that's really important that we do that because that increases the amount we need a lot. And if we don't take care of that, who should? Uh, so just to remind you, the amount uh, for shipping and aviation is uh, for these three countries alone is more, hundred, more than expected to be more than 400 petajoule in the future. And part of this, if not all, has to be renewable fuels. So that's a lot. So you, uh, so all of you and from industry as well, should be busy building up factories for producing these fuels. But of course, there are some challenges, uh, and that's also discussed a lot in this meeting. Is the sustainable biomass enough, and what is sustainable biomass? Um, and then uh, clearly, we need a set of sector integration. And I'll come back to. I don't think we should look at biofuels alone. We should look at biofuels together with electric fuels and CCS, because Many combination of plants will have all these uh, parts and pieces that can, so it can actually be, uh, 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 we can gain a lot of uh, synergy by combining these. Uh, I think we need carbon capture and storage. If we are going to do our part to stay below 1.5, uh, we shouldn't use it as a, that uh, then we can lean back and relax. No, we should do everything we can, and then we also need carbon capture and storage. Uh, transport, of course, should be green, and then we can also hope for some new uh, uh, 
inventions that can technology inventions that can make life easier for us uh, but i don't think either we should wait for that we should go for all the solutions we know we can do and then hope that we'll be uh, get some help on the way so also why carbon capture in, in the nordic countries uh, first of all uh, because we can we have uh, actually the industry who can do it we have a big oil and gas industry which is this is uh, not a big career shift to start uh, storing CO2 instead uh, and we have some nice also research projects on that uh, and then we actually have the best storage facilities in Europe in the Nordic countries so if Europe and they have to would start storing CO2 then they will look to the Nordic countries and ask us if we can help them so there's also a business case in the storing CO2 from all of Europe in, in, in Nordic countries yeah, so and why? Uh, so what we can do by uh, start getting started early, also on the CO2 capturing storage, is that we can like we will buy us a bit some a time to really uh, to get rid of fossil fuels in really difficult parts of the system, which could be industry heavy transport, aviation, and so on. But again, it shouldn't be used as a as a, a, a it should not make us relax. We are still. Uh, uh, very busy in uh, if we want to stay below this. So just um, the calculation from as I should say this this uh, model runs is uh, a little more than a year old, and we are updating have been updating the model ever since. So end of this month we will have new results on the homepage where all of you can go in and check it out. So but I will refer to that later on. But what we came to here is that from 240 we should uh, store around. Uh, uh, 20 to 40 uh, million tons of CO2 a year, uh, mainly in Norway and Sweden and also in Denmark. Uh, and that is both from industry and from the power and heat sector. And that, I think, in the new calculation, this will change because we have a lot more options in industry and for fuel production than we had in the. So here, the, the, the power sector has taken up the most uh, uh, of the storage. And what we need to make function is. Uh, integrated energy system where all these uh, things bits and pieces play together because if we lose fuel for uh, transport sector uh, this fuel uh, these factories will have surplus heat that can be used in our district heating grid and they need electricity and we have to put up a lot of wind and solar power to actually to fuel this and at the same time they can help balancing the power system because uh, you can store the fuels you can't store electricity very well so it's easier to make fuel from that and, and then use that as a storage and so on but that also influences how you can uh, plan how you should uh, uh, plan the capacity of the plant and so on. so if you're not you're just optimizing for running 8640 hours a year uh, this, uh, then it won't fit into a future system so we also have to build into the system, what uh, incentives for the industry to make plants which has surplus capacity so they can kick in when needed and so on. So there's a lot of things uh, that we need to solve uh, and we should start solving that right now. What we also see is because of this need, both for fuel and electricity, we will put up a lot of wind in the Nordic countries, which will give us uh, export uh, in some situations. So we can uh, adapt for that. We need uh, a lot more uh, transmission lines. The orange here are the planned ones, and then the red one is what we're modeling. What modeling calculation says that we need to uh, have extra uh, in that, and potentially we can export a lot. Uh, here we got around 150 kilowatt hours, but these can also be used for producing electric fuels or other things and export that. So it's not. We're not saying this is <laughs> the solution. We're just looking at okay, what is what is happening when we are pushing the system as we do, and then some findings. Other findings when using a system approach is that uh, if we constrain the biomass by saying it has to be sustainable, then it will be harder to get biomass that will push for more wind and solar, and also push for more electric fuels, uh, and then which again will push for more wind and solar. If we have a breakthrough on CCS technology, that could go two ways. Either it's uh, on processes or power plants, then we will have a high demand for biomass because uh, we need negative emissions. So we need biomass to uh, store the CO2 from. And that will reduce the need for 
uh, wind and solar. On the other hand, if we get uh, uh, CCS technologies that don't need fuel, like direct air capture, that will of course increase the demand for electricity. So there's a, a lot of uh, interactions uh, in these systems. Then we looked at some scenarios. So I won't bother you with the, you took the potential of biomass, and I think at least are a bit high when I see the other presentations from this, these days. So these are quite optimistic. But the thing is, we compared the situation in two scenarios where, where, where we are allowed to import biomass and biofuels and where we are not. So uh, the NEGP is Nordic EGP, that's starting from 2016, made by the Nordic country. So that's like the baseline. But then IPCC 2014, that's where we uh, stay within the limit of uh, the 1.5 degree from the 2014 number. So this is the strict target. So we're really pushing the model to the limit. And what we see is a uh, power in heat sector, which is mainly Denmark and Sweden, who has some fossil fuels here, is very fast phasing out uh, uh, the fossil fuels. And, uh, and what we see is, of course, if we allow, uh, if we are forcing the market to stay within this, it needs uh, to, to uh, invest in CCS and store uh, quite some, some, uh, some CO2. Uh, if we look at uh, then uh, this scenario where we don't allow for import of biomass, uh, then we have trouble in producing in getting some fuels to, to transport the industry. And so we uh, ending up with uh, higher emissions and therefore a higher need for carbon capture and storage. And here you can see the difference really between the two scenarios. Uh, if we limit import of biomass, we need to store almost twice the amount of uh, CO2 as in if not limited. And the need for biofuels we see in this scenario, where we have all sectors, including uh, our part of uh, international aviation and shipping, is around five to 600 petafuels of biomass, or biofuels, not biomass, biofuels. So this is uh, quite an amount of uh, uh, fuel that we need to produce. Uh, but here in the model, it chose to produce around 100 uh, petafuel in the, these three countries and then import the rest. Uh, from global markets. And that, of course, has, there will be a big change if we do not allow the model to import. Then it drops from here to here. So this is domestic produced, and then we allow for a small import here, uh, but mainly, mainly not. Uh, and that means, of course, that the total system is changing because now we need electric fuels for this or direct electrification of some process, both in industry and transport. So what we do really has a big influence on what we need to invest in and so on. So I think instead of just waiting to wait and see what happens, I think we should discuss what we would like to have should happen. So we can start planning this uh, also because it's so big industry, it's so big plants and so on, so much money has to go into this that it would be nice if we can like plan it a bit so we're not wasting too much uh, funding in, in private assets. Yeah. yeah. So what is the that we need, of course, to push technology development, and we have seen in some cases we have really jumped uh, like in the solar PV. So we need to have some jumps within the fuel production and CCS. Uh, so, but we don't get to see these jumps unless we are really pushing for it. So that's what we should ask our governments and research institutions to push for, and of course also industry, uh, so we can help them getting up up to speed. So, and that was basically what I was saying. So instead of just sitting and waiting to see what kind of technology will win, I think we should try to create the future instead of uh, uh, just uh, waiting and see what happens uh, because we will waste time and money on that. And you can read a lot about more about these projects and studies at the Nordic Energy uh, 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 research homepage, Nordic Energy. Uh, and uh, the results I just shown you are presented on this homepage. We're we'll just working on a new homepage just called Shift from the Shift project, shift.tokni.com. And there you will see a lot more detailed results from all the sectors and so on with different scenarios where you can see what would the demand, what could the demand be for biofuels and electric fuels in the different sectors, giving different assumptions about can we import biomass or not, can we use CCS or not, and different growth factors and so on. So. Hopefully that will be useful for all of you. Thank you.
thanks a lot. I don't think we've got time for questions, but I think that, that quote from Abraham Lincoln summed up really what, what this conference has all been um, about. So thank you for that. And that's really good. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, and thank you to all our speakers again. We can just get them all right. And uh, I want mean, you all, in an orderly fashion, to make your way through to the uh, next door for the uh, closing uh, remarks. Thank you.